Because we're living in it, we've lost sight of actually how significant this is. It's not necessarily a new phenomenon. Can I start by asking you, what is the scale of the issue that we are talking about? Has the world really changed in front of us? I would say it has changed. I think if you look at uh, what's been happening, particularly within Europe uh, over the last 20 years, we've seen movements, uh, national populist movements become notably more successful than they used to be, including in democracies that historically um, were always thought to be immune to this trend. Think about the alternative for Germany, think about Sweden Democrats, think even in British politics, the UK Independence Party. Uh, prior to uh, the 21st century, Britain was always thought to be immune to this trend. And of course, we've seen Donald Trump and we've seen changes in um, Brazil and also Central and East European states, notably Hungary and, and Poland. Not everywhere. Um, democracies like uh, Spain, uh, Ireland have not seen the same kind of uh, political revolt. But, but I would argue this has been one of the most striking developments over the last two decades. You see it the same way, Daphne? Um, not, not quite. I think I, I do agree with Matt that something is happening, and indeed we can see this in electoral change, if you like. So look at 2017 elections across Europe. In France, Marine Le Pen made it to the second round. In the Netherlands as well, Get Wilders' party um, uh, was second. We can see it in my country, Greece, as well, with the far-right Golden Dawn being successful and elsewhere across Europe. But I think where I disagree with Matt is that this is sort of an indication that the world is changing. In, if we look at it a bit further back, we will see that parties, niche parties, such as the ones that we just described, have also performed well electorally in the past. So it's not necessarily a new phenomenon. Um, these parties have had success before in the 1990s and early 2000s, then success uh, electoral performance declined, and then it increased again. So I think it might make sense to look at that more in terms of waves rather than a linear, ever-increasing phenomenon. Oh. I mean, just to come on that, we've never had a national populist in the White House like Trump. I mean, you might say Andrew Jackson, but, you know, in, in contemporary politics, we've never had a national populist. You've never had a Lager in Italy on 35% of the vote in the polls. We've never had the Austrian Freedom Party getting 49% in the presidential election. We've never had a populist party in post-war Germany winning seats in every single state parliament and more than 90 seats in the Bundestag. And even Le Pen, yeah, of course her father was successful, but she got a record 33% in 2017. And also, like I say, democracies like Sweden, which to me are the most striking ones, that are historically always very liberal, very tolerant states. But even there, you get a party that was actually rooted in neo-Nazism, so winning 18% of the vote quite easily and only a short period of time. I think this is, I think, I think because we're living in it, we've lost sight of actually how significant this is. But do you see, you, is it waves and the waves are getting bigger sometimes or consistently bigger? Well, I think if we look at it again, I don't have my data in front of me, perhaps I should have, but for example in the Netherlands, Liz Pim Fortuyn got the highest ever percentage of a, of a far right or radical right or populist party, however you want to call it, I believe in 2002 or something like that. And also in, in France, the Front National got a very high percentage in, um, in national elections, not presidential elections, again back in the late 1990s. So it, it's not... An, the FPO entered a coalition government in 1999 for the first time. So, yes, perhaps the, the, this might be a, a, a quite a, a pronounced phenomenon, but it's not new. It, we have seen these parties get a lot of votes before. Well, we'll come back to all of these uh, issues, but it, what you're saying provokes the question, <laughs> why? You know, what, 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 how did we get here, even if we disagree about the scale of what we're looking at? You see this very much as driven by economics and other factors l contributing to economics. You don't see it as such a cultural phenomenon as Matthew does. Not, 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 not quite. So if I can put my argument in a nutshell, I think what I'm arguing is that what these parties are doing is mobilising on multiple insecurities, some of which have to do with culture, but some of which also have to do with economics and labour market competition.
where they are successful, and the reason, for example, as you said earlier, that oh, we've never seen a party like that in Germany before, the reason why they're able to mobilize these insecurities successfully is also another factor that we're overlooking, what we call supply in political science, which is the way they're using nationalism and their rhetoric to attract people. Instead of saying, we are racist parties, like these parties in the past used to do, they're saying, no, we don't oppose people because of their... Um, their their blood or creed or origin or, or ethnic descent, we don't want them because they are ideologically opposed to our version of liberal democratic values. And so they become more appealing to the population. They've rebranded which, themselves a bit. Absolutely. Which votes for them because they have many different reasons to vote for them. Some, yes, oppose, oppose the establishment for cultural reasons, but some also have economic grievances, job market competition grievances, and other all sorts of other types of, of grievances. Matthew, you see it a bit differently. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, globally we set up this debate about is it all to do with economics or is it to do with culture? And in a way, that debate is a little bit unhelpful in the sense that I don't think anyone would ever say it's all this and it's none of the other. But I would certainly argue that the primary drivers, I think all the evidence would suggest, um, are certainly cultural. And it is really about this fear over how immigration and rising ethnic change are impacting not only upon people's economic position but but upon their national culture, their ways of life um, and their broader community uh, as they see it. I think we still underestimate how strongly attached people in the West feel towards the nation. Um, we still, I think, underestimate how uh, uncomfortable people feel with not only the scale of change uh, but the pace uh, of change and if you look for example at the Brexit vote if you look at the Trump vote if you looked at some of the studies uh, on what's happening uh, in Europe um, I think they tell a pretty coherent story that uh, while these movements do attract some people that are in precarious economic positions they also attract a lot of people that are you know full-time jobs pretty well off quite secure but they feel intensely anxious over the pace of this demographic change and on top of that you add layers like issues around security terrorism specific concerns over the role of islam in europe uh, and that's where these parties are really uh, galvanizing support but we're, we're struck aren't we sometimes looking at the data here that the the real uh, some, some of the real strengths for populist movements can sometimes be in the exact geographical part of, say, this country or another country where the diversity isn't there. Where you're not talking about uh, people threatening your way of life by eating something different or wearing something different walking down your road. There's nobody like that around you. Well, absolutely, but um, and different countries are different. There, are, If you look at it, actually, many countries that have low levels of actually immigration have got very high levels of far-right party support, right? So it doesn't, immigration doesn't necessarily correlate at the national level. So, hmm. um, but I, I, do, I do want to add here to something that, that Matt said earlier. I think, I just want to say first that I don't disagree that culture is a driver. It is. But I think the fallacy or the problem there is that we make two assumptions that are problematic. Assumption number one is that... Um, you're assuming that immigration scepticism means cultural uh, a cul is a cultural issue, and I think that's a problem. And number two, well, you say that's a problem. Just to cut in there, just you build but on that one. You presumably think that's a problem because so many people who are ethnic minorities sometimes have very are amongst those with the strongest opinions. Well, I mean, because higher immigration. precisely because absolutely there are there are many people who oppose immigration because they believe that immigrants are. Uh, competitors for them in the labour market, or they are a problem for the provision of, you know, the collective goods of the state, which become scarce in conditions of crisis, such as, you know, public services, our NHS, etc., etc. So it, we shouldn't necessarily equate uh, scepticism towards immigration to, oh, this is a cultural issue. And number two, I think a, a fallacy that's been made generally is that people say, okay, if the economy was the driver, then we should see only the lowest strata uh, voting for the for, for these parties. But actually, people who are more well off are voting. Therefore, the economy is. Not not a problem. But there's no reason to assume that relative deprivation is not a driver. Perhaps these people uh, feel they are worse off than they were uh, uh, comparing to themselves in the past or feel worse off than their neighbour. So I think there is a mu much more nuanced argument that can be made with regards to labour market competition and the economy. Mm. I mean, I think you'll really enjoy the book because we have a whole chapter on relative deprivation I'm and we sure. pick up that argument uh, too. But we argue that it is ultimately secondary to 
to culture. I mean, let me pick up that issue that you raised about levels uh, of migration in some countries versus others. I mean, take Hungary, for example, or Central and Eastern Europe, where you have low levels of migration, few refugees, for example, but some of the strongest yeah. national populist movements. We have to ask ourselves the question of, well, why is this the case? And it's not true that this is to do with some kind of you know, lack of experience with the wonders of diversity and migration. What that reflects, I would argue, is, is partly the uh, enduring legacy of highly nationalistic uh, cultures and also a strong fear uh, that their societies will be transformed into what they see in Western Europe. And many of these uh, societies, we should note, are also depopulating. Look at Bulgaria, look at Lithuania. By 2050, they're going to shrink by about 15%. And they are racked with a real sense of uh, anxiety um, because they didn't think that signing up to liberalism, they, they thought this was about economic liberalism, they didn't think this was also going to be about sort of social liberalism and everything that comes with that. And that, as a consequence, is why they're so receptive and to these do, movements. You talk about that in the, in the book a bit. You, you think this has got a lot to do with a, a liberal elite imposing political correctness, not necessarily just in terms of uh, uh, whether you welcome uh, people from a different ethnic background, but across the board, whether it's talking about gender issues, other issues like that. So what? Yeah. So essentially, what we're arguing is, we need to think much more seriously about how our political systems have evolved over you know, the duration, essentially, of of democracy in two respects. One is. There's always been a tradition within democracy that has been very suspicious of the masses, of the people, that's looked down on voters at certain points. We can see that now, I would argue, in our Brexit debate. They haven't made the right decision. Go back and vote again. But we can trace it all the way back to Plato. The second issue is, over time, our political representatives, and I would argue some of our media representatives, have become more disconnected from the average voter. They've become more highly educated, more affluent, more socially liberal. And that disconnect has now become so pronounced because we're, we're talking about these identity issues, about Let's immigration, clear, about refugee crisis, about these kinds of... But there you're talking about issues like gay marriage, for instance, where you think maybe the Liberal League got ahead of the voters, didn't bring them with them on the journey. That's what well, I mean, take Angela Merkel and the refugee crisis and the handling of that clearly was a case where a decision was made by people within the corridors of power that a large number of voters did not agree with and as a consequence we're still living through what I would argue is pretty much the the, the fragmentation of the German party system. I think you can probably make a case for how that all goes back to that decision. Uh, people will wonder if the you're, you're nudging towards saying that we, we need to retreat from certain liberal uh, attitudes no, or I'm, slow them down. Uh, I'm saying what? we need to reform our political systems in a way to give these groups that are voting for these movements a much greater voice at the table. Daphne, what do you think of that? I'm slightly sceptical of that. I, I, I agree with you, I have to say, on the hungry point and on the sort of certain authoritarian nationalist political cultures and traditions. I completely agree with that point. Um, but again, I think that w we're ten we tend to make this into a sort of one-size-fits-all phenomenon. Things that are happening in Hungary is similar to what's happening in the UK. You mentioned uh, Trump in the US. You mentioned Western Europe, Eastern Europe. I, I think these cases are far more different, really. There is an overarching commonality there, but I do think we need to understand certain cases in, in, in particular as well in order to see the dynamics of, of, of what is going on. But in calling it really like a national populism everywhere, I think the mistake perhaps that we're making is that we're assuming that there is one indivisible people that have w want one thing. So if your argument at the end of the day, and I haven't read the book, so forgive me if I'm making a mistake here, but if what you're saying is we need to, w we have taken power away from the people, but we need to give power back to the people, then the question inevitably becomes, but do the people are the people one thing? And I think that they're not. One thing that is fundamental about our, our democracies, even our liberal democracies, is that really they consist of different social groups who have not only different but actually often conflicting preferences. That, that, that's and, a separate point, though, But, but I would it's argue. not. It's, it's yeah. absolutely spot on, the point, well. because, these, because I think what we're neglecting is that these parties may be getting elected by very different social groups for very different Indeed. reasons. No, when then for these parties if they do come to power, then what will they do to reconcile? This mm. is what governments men are meant to do, is to actually propose policies that reduce the conflict lines in society and reconcile different conflicting views. But what we're seeing now with this phenomenon and, and feeding into it in a way is increasing polarization. Well, they feed on, feed yeah, on, they no, feed on divisions. On divisions and polarization. No, nobody's saying there is so, one type of 
there's one people. I mean, the populace would certainly say that, but but I'm not saying that. What 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 we're arguing is that we are seeing a battle not over whether we should have democracy or not. I think some people have really stretched this argument about the return of fascism way too far. You know, public support for democracy across North America and Europe is incredibly strong and entrenched. 80, 89, 90% of voters say... I want to live in a representative democracy, I value a representative democracy, but what we are seeing is a battle over what conception of democracy we're going to see play out. And there is a traditional liberal conception, and there is a, mar there is a more direct conception that gives greater influence to ordinary voters. And what it was the original that, conception well, of democracy. what does that really mean? If so, for example... Let's take... A, let's take, a, let's take um, Hungary now. Mm. I mean, we're seeing... Maybe you think that's an extreme example, maybe I should go for another one, but the, you... you I think we see Let's what the their version Let's of the UK, right, uh, with the democracy is, and you're right, that isn't mm -hmm. my version of liberal mm -hmm. democracy. Um, they they have been allowed to come to the table, their voices are being heard, as you say, mm -hmm. and the consequences are that everything I understand to be uh, democratic values and institutions uh, are being undermined. Well, take, take the UK as a counterexample. I mean, one example would be the referendum in 2016. That was a democratic mechanism, the highest turnout since 1992, that was designed ultimately to give the people a greater say over an issue that was seen to be central to the nation the UK's membership of the EU. One argument would be, you know, because all, all of this debate hinges on the question of how do we reply to this stuff? How do we reply to this moment in the West? I would argue that one reply, not the only reply, one reply, is to think very seriously about political reform. The EU, for example, how can we make the EU far more transparent? Well, in, a, in an age when the EU is just ruled not to release details of parliamentary expenses, how can we make these institutions far more accountable to the people? Because we can have these discussions about how populists are evil and they're demagogues and everything else. And when a country like Hungary says, I'm not comfortable with a quota system, I'd like something else. And then we say, well, Article 7 for you, you're undermining democratic regime. And then we say, well, gee, why are all these people voting for movements that say, no one in the in the broader order is interested in listening to them. I think we collectively need to put ourselves in some uncomfortable territory and think about well, what would political reform look like? So in the UK, how about more referendums on the local or regional level, more working class people into our political system and our media, uh, more non graduates into politics? Why are we so dependent upon? highly educated MA, PhD holders. These are the questions. How can we move institutions outside of London? And your book talks quite a bit about well, Channel 4's on, on the move. Indeed, yeah. but, that's uh, wonderful. And your book yeah. talks about the different profiles, social profile of people who come into politics. What, what, what do you think, Daphne, when you think of things that might um, uh, mitigate the rise of populism? So, so I think reforms are obviously always good. It's, it's always good to, 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 look, to look ahead and try and fix things. But I don't think that having more referenda is the solution. Look at how divisive this referendum has actually been. And yeah, you can agree or disagree with the outcome, but wherever you stand, all of a sudden now there is this, this massive dividing line. Look at even us who talk about populism. There is a massive division now between those who say, oh, we need to address it this way or that way or another. I suppose Matthew now, would say it was always there. We just happened to pay attention to are, it. Are we paying attention to it or are we exacerbating? I think we should also pay attention to some of the underlying insecurities that I mentioned earlier that are perhaps driving this phenomenon um, indirectly. So we should again, we shouldn't neglect again, so for example, labour market policies, we shouldn't neglect uh, so we're talking about wages, hours, pay and We're talking about employment protection legislation, mm -hmm. we're talking about uh, different labour laws that might actually secure people, make people feel more secure in their employment and so to to, to, to act it to serve in a manner as to as to not to exacerbate grievances that people might so already absolutely. have. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, let's do economic reform. So let me ask you a question. If yeah. we had a perfectly equal economic settlement where there was no inequality and everybody had a, a stable, uh, dignified, uh, you know, respectable job, would we would we have populism? I can't answer that. I have no way of answering that. And because unless have you. we deal unless <laughs> so. we deal with the cultural stuff too, and except, for example, that some people, in fact, in Britain, 75% of people say they still want to see migration policy reformed, or they want to Absolutely. have a different approach from the government on that issue. And my worry is the economic argument is so seductive for lots of, I would say, us, people on the kind of you know liberal left wing, everyone says, well, let's just make the economy much more fairer and equal. 
And we're still going to be left with this elephant in the room, which is immigration. And we have to think about how do we reform it? Is, should we think about slowing it, slowing it down like the US did in, in, in the post-war period in order to focus more on integration and building cohesion? So, so yes, so, and vice versa. If we neglect the economy and focus on the culture, we won't solve the problem either. So I guess what I'm saying, what I'm suggesting is that we need to focus on both, but we need to do it fundamentally and primarily in a way that doesn't divide the people, the many different people, more than we already have done. The wave that was really feeding some of the feeling in that referendum mm. was actually images that people were seeing of Muslim uh, population uh, maybe coming across uh, the Med uh, from Syria or mm. African people coming across the Med. There was those images that mm. definitely fed some of the... But if you look at it, it, well, I would, which, I would argue... Which is my point. Well, <laughs> no, I would disagree. I'd say if you look at just the, the dynamics of that referendum vote, and we did a study on this, you found that actually support for leave wasn't strongest in all white areas where there was little diversity. It was strongest, actually, in local authorities that had experienced the highest rate of change, demographic change, in the 10 years before the vote. Boston is a great example. Boston gave 75% of the vote to leave. And in the 10 years before the referendum, the percentage uh, of Boston's population that was white British basically collapsed, as you had a kind of very sharp demographic churn. Now, this stuff is sensitive, and it's awkward, and it's difficult to talk about. But it matches up with the research on Trump. Trump's vote was strongest in counties that had experienced very sharp demographic change. And the evidence is there. I, I, I don't know personally understand. You can't, I mean, the evidence is, is pretty overwhelming on that, I, I would argue. The elephant in the room here as well is how these parties have been able to mobilize on, popul to, on, on um, terrorism. And t terrorism is something we haven't spoken about. They have used, look at the Front National after the series of terrorist attacks that took place in France and how they have linked this whole anti-Muslim image to all these people are threatening not only to our liberal values, but also to our personal safety. They, they come into our country and they, they say this even for people who are actually French citizens but of, uh, of, of non-French origin. So they have been able to mobilise on that in, in, a, in a very much a, a supply side manner. And I think social media, sorry, sorry yeah. excuse me. And I think social media and, 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 and ways of, 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 of automatically immediately reacting on Facebook or on mm. other forms is, is, is pivotal to this because it allows all these people to get together, exchange their ideas. So I definitely think it exacerbates mm. yeah. the way their communication and feeding into their ideas. Like, this is not really contrary to what you're but, saying, I don't think. No, no, but the issue about terrorism, I would say, is my frustration, at least, in terms of having looked at this, you know, like you for many years, is the only reason a lot of these movements are able to get so much traction on those issues is because we're not really engaging in those issues in a, in a societal way. So take, for example, one of the biggest issues for... Uh, groups in Britain is child sexual exploitation and that is the issue that basically runs through the English Defence League, Tommy Robinson and, and that side. Now with the exception of some reporters who have gone into that issue to talk about it, I would argue that nationally we've really basically given that issue over to the far right. We've just said here's an issue that you can campaign on exclusively and we're not really going to talk about it and have a discussion about it. And I think, you know, to, it, Tommy Robinson turned up in 2009. How is this person still a prominent figure in our national debate? Because we haven't talked about these issues, I think. But you're assuming that the people want, the people should get. And I think the problem is with this no, line I'm of saying, thinking... No, I'm saying sorry, that issue again, is partly sorry, 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 a legitimate just, issue just, that needs to be Because I forget about. my train of thought. Mm. I think this, is, this assumption, the people want, the people should get, and there is no society that doesn't have its discontent. We give the people this, tomorrow they'll have another source of discontent. Tomorrow they'll have another source of discontent. So at some point the question becomes, fine, let's you know give the people what they want, but how do we reconcile when different social groups want different things? How will we rec reconcile those, for example, who might gain from immigration or who might have positive um, outlook on immigration? What, what happens when they become the discontent? How will we then appease them. Just one on something that has been around uh, in the last few weeks, um, and I'll, I'll ask your opinion as well, Daphne, but it, uh, taking part in a debate called Is Rising Ethnic Diversity a Threat to the West? Um, is that coming a bit too much onto the mm. terrain uh, mm. of, of the people that um, maybe one should be giving a distance from? 
I think the initial title for that debate was not the right title. I think the underlying motivation behind that debate, which is to try and take that ground away from people who are very irresponsibly framing that uh, discussion, I think the motive was sincere. I think the motive was was perfectly legitimate. I think there are millions of people in Europe and North America who want to actually talk about the broader effects of migration and ethnic change. And to be frank, um, Gary, if if we don't have that discussion in the mainstream, um, then someone else is going to have that discussion. Um, the title has been changed uh, now, and the panel, uh, by the way, is one of the most diverse panels you could ever possibly have. Uh, we have people from the ultra kind of libertarian wing. We have people who have spent their lives fighting for equality and rights for minorities on the Equality and Human Rights Commission. And we have people who have spent a great deal of their careers researching these issues. What did you think, Daphne, when you saw the title? I, I did follow this. I, I did think the title was, say, slightly unfortunate. And I do disagree with the uh, Matt, as you as, as you know, just from this, but I also strongly believe that they have every right to go and have their debate and call it whatever they want. And I, I'm very much a supporter of freedom of speech, so I don't think that there is anything wrong in that. And if the panel is diverse, then all the better. So I want to throw some quick, quick, relatively quick fire questions, if I if I may. Uh, Daphne, do you think there is potential for a new right wing force in this country? We've watched UKIP come and go. I think that there is potential for a, for a right-wing force, but I think what's happening now is that essentially the... So this is party competition, very, very clear-cut. The Tories have moved further to the right. They are addressing these immigration issues, so UKIP is no longer necessary. If they don't, someone else will come in that, take that space to, to do so. Matthew? I agree. I agree. I think we're in a very fragile moment. I think that everything depends on what the Brexit deal is, and everything depends upon whether that clear demand for reform of migration is is uh, is met. What impact would a second referendum have on national populism in this country? I think it depends on the outcome. Um, I'm personally... Uh, Even if it was called, it would have a bit of an I'm impact. I'm personally quite anxious about what a second referendum would do, not, not only to the nature of the debate, but in terms of trust in the political system, engagement, particularly among workers, working class voters, who we saw drifting into apathy before that referendum. Um, you're effectively sending a message. However you dress it up, you are sending a message that... Um, that we need to ask voters to to go back to the polls. And I think that could be potentially quite disruptive. What do you think, impact I, on the second referendum? I think I am very worried that the first referendum has divided this country enough that the, the second one might fix or not fix. But I, I'm worried that the, that the division is, is, is a problem in itself that it has created. Can I ask a, a final question? Is this a moment or an era we're entering? Well, our argument in the book is that we're entering into a new period of volatility, that the bonds between main parties and voters have broken down to such an extent that we should now expect to see quite continual challenges from new populist movements, not only on the right, perhaps also from the radical left and from Greens, but that the golden era of representative democracy that basically ran from the late 1940s through to the early 1990s is, is done that we are entering into a much more volatile political world. Moment or an era? I'd say yes and no. Um, yes, volatility, but also golden era. I mean, we've seen a lot, as I said, of conflict, of co conflict lines within society, of fringe parties, niche parties, instability uh, um, during the whole period that you're describing. So I think it will be a moment if we make it into one. And by talking about it on the supply side, by feeding into it and exacerbating precisely those societal divisions we can turn that it I'm into talking an about, era. then we will turn it into a, a, a massive uh, thing. But a I, I don't. Chapter. So maybe we just don't talk about it. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that. But I'm suggesting that that we don't exacerbate it even more. You very kindly have been talking about it. Thank you, Daphne. Thank you, Matthew. Really appreciated you sparing your time. Very good chat. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.